Wednesday is our men's Bible study, so I encourage uh, you to come out if you can. Um, if the stairs are a problem, we can have a Bible study up here as well. Just hardy, we have filet mignon, pork chops. No. If you brought them, you would. Cheesecake, you know, that kind of thing. All right, let's read Colossians together. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And ye have therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. Let's uh, stand together. We'll sing the first hymn. When morning gilds the sky. Colossians chapter 3. We're only going to look at the first four verses, but I'm going to read up to verse 7 this morning. Colossians.
Colossians chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil compusiveness, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walk some time when you live in them. We're going to stop right there this morning. I cut that up on purpose um, for this section uh, for clarity and uh, off, obviously for application for us as well. So we'll look at this passage this morning as we go to prayer this morning. Uh, pray for Pastor Art and Louise. Um, you know, it's going to be a week to week just like the rest of you. If you can get out and get up and get out or get up and get out However that works for you, you know, um, obviously as you get older, um, the, the normal tasks of life become more difficult. You know, driving in the dark almost becomes a non-existent thing, and some of you understand that, and, um, and then other things as well. So the Lord knows our hearts and knows our needs, and so we just trust him for those things. Uh, continue to pray for Tony and his family, or not Tony himself, but his family, and I was thinking about that this morning. The little opportunity I had um, really has nothing to do with the words that I shared and the word of God that I shared with them. And, you know, obviously it's God's will uh, what happens next. But uh, there were some that were unsaved that were at the funeral. Uh, pray for Jimmy and his kids. We miss Jimmy, but Jimmy had a mission. And he couldn't convince his kids to come here. So he found a church closer by where they live because he lives out on the East Island trying to get his kids to go to church. And so I'm not sure how much success he's having with them, but we'll keep praying for him anyway. And pray for Vinny as well. I hope to meet him one day, you know, and uh, see his rubber foot, you know. I I'm sure it's not made out of rubber now, no, titanium or something like that. But uh, he's a young guy, and that can be a very depressing thing to happen, you know. And so I've been praying for Jared and others that might help him. And continue to pray for Dolores. Uh, um, Al shared last week that she has uh, foregone or stopped the chemo, and uh, that's true, right, Al? Yes. Sir. And uh, you know, she, uh, the chemotherapy was just making her life miserable. Very similar to Art, he stopped his Coumadin and some other things because it was just his life quality was zero. You know, it, he was having an allergic reaction to what, some of those medications, and um, last Sunday he looked pretty good, so he's. Um, you know, so we just keep praying for them. Uh, pray for Lady Keith. And uh, Keith got electrocuted last week, but still here. He's like Uncle Fester. Put a light bulb in his mouth, but um, he just got zapped. It's usually me, Elaine. He says, yeah, the power is off, and then I get zapped. But, uh, I try to make him be careful. You know, that's why I'm there yelling at him and telling him don't touch that, you know. But, I, no, I don't know what he's doing, and I'm clueless as well, you know, so if it wasn't for him, I'd probably be already electrocuted. It was only 110, right? Yeah, we don't, we didn't measure it. I put the meter on his ear, but it didn't show. How's your foot doing, Jay? Good, okay, so uh, continue to pray for Ronnie and for Miriam. More, Miriam is good. Wherever she's at, she's like a candle. You know, I'm sure that church is like, Praising the Lord that she moved back, and we're missing her big time. I pray for Ronnie, you know, because she could get in a slump easy. She's by herself, and I've been praying for other believers to come around her. The church she goes to, she goes to, but I'm not sure how much interaction she has with them. Um, I pray for her, and I'm not sure exactly how much her family is really even uh, going to see her. I pray for Stephen and Rebecca and their child. I don't remember if I ever got the name of the baby. Margaret. Margaret, that's right. Yeah. 
Now, I'm not sure if you really realize this, but they uh, serving in a place where they're not wanted. It's a Muslim country, you know, and the only reason they're there is because of a hospital. But over the years he's been there, they've had some trouble to the point where he had to move on the, onto the campus itself. So pray for him and uh, uh, pray for Jonathan. I haven't heard from him lately, but he's uh, he took over for some missionaries on furlough in Japan, ABWEs, and um, you know, pray for him as he tries to work out the marriage thing. And, uh, you know, so he might come back married. I told him, I said, you might as well just get married when you're over there, you know. And then uh, when you get a chance to come to the States, he can come with you and your father can do something here. And as long as you're married, it'll make it a lot easier. And uh, pray for Dylan, you know. Uh, I told you what he said about you guys. Even though you're ancient, you, you, you're, his, you're his family. <laughs> Well, he looks at me like I'm old too, and I'm a young guy, right? But he struggles at school, and if you ever went to a university, you know how bad it is, as far as uh, sin and things that you go on on campuses. And he lives in a dormitory that's mixed, you know, with uh, women, and uh, so that's that's always something that he's been fighting with. And um, so let's pray for him that he gets involved in a good Christian church, which he has. Uh, but he's uh, um, has struggles with his uh, studies as well. Um, anybody have a prayer request? Please pray for my niece who was recently diagnosed with MS. She was a former member here. Um, pray that this they could kind of halt the progression. How old is she, Jen? Does she, does she, was she a member here when she was a kid, or? Yeah. Yeah? Oh. In fact, we were baptized in Hempstead the same day as she was. Nice. And she was baptized here? Or in Hempstead? In Hempstead. Oh. Oh, okay. Where does she live now? Up, but it's called Bridgeport. It's not far from Syracuse. Oh, okay. She's visited here. Oh, I think I remember that. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, we'll pray for her. What's her name? Denise. Okay. All right, let's pray to the other Father. We're thankful for this opportunity. And um, some people would get uh, concerned about um, the world around us, and uh, we might, for for the some parts of our existence, have some concerns about what's going on. Uh, but you have given us your word that clearly tells us that you are our complete control. And uh, um, whether a man or a woman claims that they can do certain things, we know you can. And your Bible has uh, uh, given us information about your love for us, your care for us, and how you are, will meet our needs. And so these things that the rest of the world fears for, uh, we have this guarantee from you. So first, help us to, to totally rely upon you and uh, help us to experience the freedom of not having to worry about uh, what the threat is outside as we see uh, the world kind of tumbling down, especially in our own country. And we pray, Father, for our, our kids and our grandchildren and uh, their futures, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would intervene and uh, bring revival to our country. It could happen. It's your will, of course, and uh, help us to be a part of that as far as uh, living for you before the people that we live before and in our community here. We pray, Father, for um, Pastor Art and Louise and that you would continue to bless them and uh, uh, just be with them as they trust you for their lives. We pray for Tony and uh, or Tony's family and the kids, Father, that you would just... Uh, allow uh, his uh, ministry, his uh, witness over the years, uh, maybe to make uh, inroads into their family. Pray for Jimmy and his kids as well, uh, that he would be a catalyst to see them come to church. And if not, Father, then you would bring them back our way. Uh, pray for Vinny, Father, that you would just help him back on his feet and 
give uh, Jared opportunity to share Christ with him. We pray for Dolores and that uh, you would be with her as she uh, goes off the chemotherapy and um, gets back on her feet, Father. And we pray for her and pray for Keith and Elaine. May you continually bless them and keep them safe. Um, pray for their family as well and their kids and for uh, uh, Ronnie, Father, that you would just bless her and uh, uh, help her to be involved in the church that she's going to. And we pray uh, that for Miriam as well, Lord, that you would wonderfully bless her as she ministers to the people at her church there and that you would keep her safe in her village that she lives in. Pray for Stefan and Rebecca, Father, and little Margaret, that you would keep them safe and give them opportunities to minister to the people there as they work as nurses and uh, as uh, Stefan teaches Bible studies and uh, the surrounding churches that have been planted by the hospital. We pray for Jonathan as well as he ministers in Japan and disciples uh, uh, this fellow from um, wherever he's at from and uh, that you would uh, work out the, the difficulties uh, between um, Jonathan and his wife to be, Lord, that they might solve that problem so that they could figure out how to get married. And I pray for Dylan, Father, that you would just uh, uh, protect him from the sin that's there and uh, that help us uh, to encourage him and uh, that he would get through his studies, Father. And uh, we uh, pray for Janet's niece and that this MS would be slow they would give her the right medication or whatever is needed to, to help her along her way. And uh, we're thankful, Father, for this few minutes we have together. We pray for Justine and uh, that you would give her more opportunities to be with us and her husband. And uh, we uh, pray for uh, more people, Lord, that you would just help us to minister to whoever comes our way. And we uh, give you the praise for the rest of the morning. Help us to focus on your word, Father, and we are thankful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Sometimes I get lost in my prayers here as we communicate to the Father. Let's sing over him together, hymn 66, I am his and he is mine. <clears throat>
Street Police. The end of chapter two, we looked at some things, ritualism, mysticism, and legalism. And uh, um, within that framework, uh, he described it as the dietary restriction. This was mostly Levitical festivals, annual religious celebrations like the Passover, the Pentecost, Tabernacles, all these things uh, were in them new, the new moon. I found that out to be uh, they would have a, a sacrifice every new month, the new moon festival. That's something that the uh, um, Jewish people were doing. And uh, so these were things that some of the uh, folks were trying to uh, input in the church and uh, trying to force uh, uh, believers into more of a Judaistic uh, flavor, almost like a Messianic church, but even more severe because uh, Probably the Judaizers weren't even real believers, it could have been, but they were trying to force young believers into this kind of framework and removing their freedom. So Paul was dealing with that, trying to help them out and showing them they're free in Christ. And so in chapter 3, he starts out with a statement, and uh, this is where we're going to begin. Uh, so let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we're thankful for this moments that we have together. And really, they are just moments when we think about the time that we have um, in our lives and the uh, opportunities that we have um, to, to sit and to listen to your word and to think about what you have for us. And we're thankful for the accuracy and the reliability of your word and the truth that we have and uh, that your Holy Spirit then, if we are open to uh, being changed and growing closer to you, which is probably the case here, that your spirit would minister to us from this passage. And uh, we're all different. We all have different struggles, and um, you know that already, Father. And what we need to hear, we need to hear today, Father. We just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. There has to be an activeness in our thinking when it comes to our relationship to God. It's not a religious thing. I can see that. You know, that we go to the Baptist church and we do certain things and that part of the formalism that we have. And you have to have order. Paul even said that. Without order, there's chaos. You know, so there's nothing wrong with that. But when we talk about our relationship to God, then that takes on a different form. Because this is a, an active, working relationship to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who Paul clearly and uh, beneficially shares with us that that Jesus was the embodiment of the Godhead. So uh, there's not a confusion of trying to, uh, who do I really want to deal with? Jesus or the Father or the Holy Spirit? Because we see that in religion. Uh, some of the Pentecostal groups really focus on the Holy Spirit. He's it. You know, he gives us the power and he gives us all the stuff. Some people neglect the Holy Spirit because of fear of being thought of being a Pentecostal. And so they really damper their enthusiasm for the Word of God and their understanding of the potential of understanding the Word and applying our own lives. Uh, so there has to be a balance there. So he uses this word if in a way that we don't normally do in our country or our language. He's basically saying since. So he's talking right here to believers. And so in the Colossi church, uh, there were believers and there were non-believers. And the if fits both ways because the proof is always in the pudding, uh, not to use the colloquialism of the 18th century, but uh, in that day, um, you can say it looked really good. Have you ever had a meal that looked really good, but when you when you tucked in, it wasn't really uh, providing you with the information that you were looking for? <laughs> I've, had, I've looked at wonderful cakes and pies, and uh, um, they looked beautiful, attractive, but when I took a taste of it, mm, something changed. Um, you know, uh, instead of using sugar, the guy put in a half a pound of salt. And I've seen that happen on these cooking shows. And boy, it really looked nice until you took a bite out of it, you know. And so this is something that we have to kind of consider with the if. You know, if you're a true believer, then we're, we're together on this. And he says, if this happened to you, uh, risen with Christ, this phrase risen with Christ has a duality to it. So 
uh, in a symbolic way, when you embraced Christ, when God wonderfully saved you, uh, you were you were raised with Him, and you were you died with Him. Your sins were paid for, and in some symbolic way, we were there. And so, since those things happen, uh, which are above, and meaning He was saying this is a spiritual thing that uh, there's an opportunity for us. Then he says, where Christ sits at the right hand of the Father, reminding us the, of the mechanics of God. Uh, when, when I think of Jesus, uh, he's the embodiment of, of Godhead. Uh, when we go to heaven, you'll be able to hug him because he's tangible. We know that from the New Testament. The disciples were there. Even before the resurrection, Jesus was holding on to, or Mary was holding on to his feet. And when he came and was on the shore making fish for the disciples, you know, this was real. He wasn't a phantom. He wasn't a ghost. So when you go to heaven, Jesus is there. He's a body. Right? I got that across because that's important for us in our thinking because we have first finite minds that really can't really get it all together. So all of us have some kind of idea of what we're looking at here. But if we can focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and that's God. You know, the Father is there as well on the throne in a spiritual sense, and the Holy Spirit resides in us. Um, we can get a handle on who God is. So there's no confusion because there are a lot of people out there given their definition of who God and Jesus and all these other things that are out there that can be quite confusing. And uh, some religions pull God the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit apart and actually just make three gods. And that's wrong. We know that. And so uh, Paul says, if this is the case for you, it reminds of where Christ is, because the Gnostics were saying, well, he was just really kind of a phantom, and he wasn't really there. Uh, he reinforces, saying he's at the right hand of the Father. So when I pray, I pray to the Father, and Jesus is like my lawyer, saying he's one of ours. He's covered in the blood. So that's a good way to look at it. I don't pray to Jesus. Uh, but I hear kids do that, and it's, it's okay because they don't really get the concept, but uh, we worship them all, all as God, but, and sometimes we separate because I depend upon the Holy Spirit every day to do his ministry. So, and the Bible tells me how I allow that to happen. That's from not sinning. So that's a big job in itself because I want the Holy Spirit to have his way with me. I want to surrender to him, so I have to get rid of anything that gets in the way. The book of Hebrews just deals with that. Uh, we're running this race, and Christ is the finish line. And I'm not racing against you, and I'm not preaching from Hebrews, so i got to make a big U-turn here, or I'll go off on a tangent, which is not beneficial to you or me as we're looking at this passage, but it really kind of relates that we, we have a structure in our relationship and he deals with this because he tells us what to do. He says in verse 2, well, let me stop there for a second before I jump ahead of myself. Because first we have an eternal position. He reminds us of because of what Christ has done, we're there. We have a place. Jesus says, I go to prepare, prepare for you a place. Right? We live in this gated community in glory. And he's making our places. Now, and I used to always laugh because I know where I'm going to be living behind my grandmother's mansion in a box that had her refrigerator in it because she was something. You know, it's funny. I don't know. I'm, I'm more than likely, uh, the man, word mansion had the idea of rooms. And in uh, Revelation, it talks about the place where we're going to dwell is 1,500 cubes. So, you know, uh, I'm going to go see Keith. He's on the 1400th floor. I hope the elevator is faster than the one at the VA. You know, <laughs> so this is something that we find in the Bible. While we're on the earth during the millennial kingdom, we're going to live in this place. Uh, but a room can be very um, misleading. I was looking at a program that talked about these elite apartments in Manhattan and the room. The bad bedroom was as big as this room, and it was just an apartment. And that was just one of the rooms in this building. That this, uh, and it was all made of uh, Spanish tile and gold. I think it might have been one of Trump's 
you know, hideaway homes. I don't know who it was, but so don't don't misunderstand that. And don't don't take it too far either, because our dwelling with God in glory is enough. It doesn't really matter where we're staying, but God does provide us information about that. So if we're in that, he tells us something about our eternal position, our relationship, and our responsibility. And this is where we're at here. Um, we find that if we have been risen with Christ, then it says, seek those things which are above. We know the phrase that says, store your treasure in heaven. Uh, that's just the beginning of it. Uh, our, our goal as believers now is anticipating one day being with him. So we're seeking things, and let's apply that today in every walk of life. Um, some people work their whole lives for a retirement, a nest egg, you know, a place to stay. And that's okay. But our goal, uh, while we're providing for our family, is to seek what God has for us, which are above, which, a.k.a., is the spiritual part of our lives. Seeking to... Uh, uh, acquire the, what things that God has promised us. So let's talk about that for a second. God has promised us peace and uh, 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 security. And uh, let's see the other thing. Provisions. He's promised all those things that are part of the relationship. So those three things, that shouldn't be on our list of worries. Worried about what, where our next meal is going. Now, none of us are worried about where our next meal is coming from, right? We have we have things. So if we were in Nigeria, uh, it would make more sense to the people that were in the audience because that's probably what's on their mind. I want to have dinner, but I got to catch it first, and they're pretty tricky, you know. Uh, whatever bush chicken they're going after, you know, chicken or ostrich or whatever. Uh, and I'm I'm out of my depth already, so I'll shut up as far as what they're trying to get. And I know in Nigeria they have towns and they have shops, but. Uh, the pastor that I kind of correspond with, uh, he has a, his church, he was so proud of it. And I was looking at that and I said that I don't even think I want to go in there because it had a thatch roof, no windows, dirt floor, and who knows what was living up in that roof in Nigeria, was slithering on the sides, you know, it's like, you know, but that was a beautiful place for him. So see, it's all, all about that. This is where we're seeking those things because what God has given us, we should treasure that God has honored us to be able to have whatever we have. Even as a pastor, most pastors go, yeah, I'm a Baptist pastor here and I got my congregation of eight or nine. You know, they wouldn't go that route. They're talking about thousands, you know. But what God has given the pastor, that's his flock. I'd rather have you as a flock of chickens than a whole bunch of them. You know, I can kind of corral you guys, you know, and I know who you are. If I had a hundred of them, I'd be, I'd be beside myself trying to make sure everything was okay. You know, so I, I feel blessed that God has even honored me and allowed me to have a church. You know, there's a lot of pastors that don't have churches, and um, rightly so, maybe because of whatever, but, you know, this is the, where God has sent me. And I look at that as a miracle in itself because when we moved down here, we were going to take care of mom and dad. And you know the story. You, you guys were desperate, and I kind of had feet and talked, and we'll take it, right? You know. But you know there was discernment there because there were some that were again. But um, I, I look at it as God's direction for us. So uh, seeking His will, God provides for us, and. Uh, we don't know where we're going to end up, but this is where we are, you know. So um, that's that responsibility. Um, I'm, we're supposed to seek those things which are above. While the world searches for truth and was carried about by every wind of doctrine, the believer was set apart and different. We have been delivered from the demands of the flesh and traditions of men. Remember Paul talked about these things in chapter 2. Don't get caught up in these philosophies. We have been born again in Christ because of our relationship with him. We are not entangled with the bondage of the false doctrines of the world. Our focus is not to be on the teaching or traditions of men. We're expected to seek those things which are above. In essence, they seek the things of God rather than the foolishness of men. And so here we are today. The bigger churches in our country today are filled with people that don't want to hear the truth. 
a lot of them, now I'm not saying them all, there's a lot of big, big churches, but most of the popular churches, you're not going to hear the Word of God uh, spooned out the same way. And uh, when the Bible calls something sin, we call it sin. And uh, our responsibility for seeking what God has for us is connected with the Word of God. So our responsibility is to seek the things that God has for us. Satan uh, would have us to become so consumed with the cares of the world that we fail to focus on the Lord and our obligations in Christian service. You know, um, and I, I, many believers live defeated and fruitless lives because they do not seek the things above. The psychiatrist says, look within. The opportunity says, look around. The optimist would say, look ahead. While the pessimist would declare, look out. The legalist would advise you to look down in an effort to find a set of shackles to put on, being bound by human tradition. God declares, look up. So we have direction. We have uh, focus on uh, seeking those things that are above, those spiritual things. Uh, notice our resource, if then we be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Now, it's obvious to us, and Paul knew the world was looking uh, to popular philosophy, human tradition. The believer was not hindered by such limitations. They had a resource the world knew nothing of, one that ex exceeded all human wisdom and resources. Our Lord lived and died upon the earth, but he didn't stay dead. I read an article about the great men of uh, religions that are buried. Muhammad, uh, Joseph Smith, number of popes, and the list went down. A lot of cults that were started, these men have died, and women, and uh, only Jesus rose from the grave. We are unique in that, that our Savior is alive today. And that life, uh, he breathes in us through his word. So the second thing we have is eternal perspective. Uh, the position is solid. Now the perspective, that's kind of uh, an anticipation that we can do. So he says, first, set. It's the idea of uh, maintaining, keeping. Set your affection. Now, affection can be translated your emotion, your intellect, uh, what, what drives you. So uh, set your affection on things above. So he echoes the first verse, not on things on earth. So we have uh, a, a directive because uh, this is where we are. We live on this earth. We cannot help but to be a part of this existence. But he tells us to set our affection on things above, not on things below. Because the things that are here are temporary. They're not going to last. You're not going to invest your time in something that in 10 years is gone. People live uh, in societies and civilizations and archaeological people dig them up. And they dug 10 feet and found a whole town. And here... Um, and they found pottery, and they found evidence of this and this and this. They existed at one time, but it was all temporary. The Bible says we're vapor and we're gone. You ever play smoking when you're a kid out in the in the winter time? You blow out, and steam comes out. I saw a video of a guy that never been in weather below 40 degrees. He was from a place where the coolest they ever got was 80, and uh, he was in Alaska. And he went outside and he went, all of a sudden he was like, well, look at this, look at this. And uh, yeah, let me catch myself now. Why was I saying that? Oh, okay. So that's the cheap entertainment part of the message. <laughs> that's why I have notes here. Okay, let's talk about, uh, there, there was something about what I was saying though. You're talking about setting your mind. Yeah, yeah, I, I lost it. Now, I could attribute it to the Holy Spirit giving you a message about something, but I'm not going to because that wouldn't be true. Because we want clarity. You just put chalk that up for another um, something that Pastor Hall gets. My, uh, my son-in-law, when we were in Mayfield, it was a really great church. All my kids were there. But my son-in-law, Bill, had a book. He called them Hallisms. 
because I used to always go up the track or something, say something silly or mispronounce something, and he recorded for me. So he has this little book, you know, he probably still has it on the mantelpiece. Uh, I actually took offense to it at first, but then after a while I thought, well, that's his way of dealing with me. But <laughs> Paul is uh, uh, trying to stress this. Now, think how hard it is for Epaphras to be able to bring this across the church from a guy they never met. They heard about him, obviously he was the Apostle Paul, but had never really experienced him. And uh, that's, that's the, that's the, and I can't think of a word that fits this, but that's the power of the word of God. Paul was writing this letter, but this was God's very word. And so this was uh, something that helped the believers along the way. They needed to hear this. Setting your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For you were once dead. You are dead. And your life is hidden in Christ. So he made this statement that doesn't make any sense to the non-believer. But to us, we understand we're dead in Christ. Just as we uh, were wonderfully saved, we died with him. That old nature had been uh, rendered ineffective. And we have a new nature so that we can become what God wants us to be. And our responsibility is to focus on what God has for us so that the old nature doesn't have its way. So uh, you're dead and your life is hidden Christ. And uh, uh, what he's saying is that our desire now is to be on what God has for us. Paul knew many hearts were set toward things that could never satisfy. They sought to please the lusts of the flesh. Their focus was on the here and now and with little or no thought of eternity. That happens a lot of times for uh, Christians. Uh, they get caught up in the life, in the world. You get kids, and they're in school, and you got to provide for them, and all these other things that we're doing. And sometimes that takes precedence over what God has for us. Look at the member of uh, Christians that have dropped away, and they're taking their kids to the baseball game on Sunday, and they're doing all these things that used to be reserved for the Lord, and they have taken that, uh, they made that decision. And I've known a lot of families that have done that and have suffered because of that. Uh, Paul wants to bring us back to reality, and he says, keep thinking about things above. Think about what Christ has done as the focus of your attention. Um, so, he deals with the distractions in life. Uh, that's why he says uh, to set your affections on things that are above. Paul understood the weakness of the flesh. So he brings a leveling down. So it's not the Apostle Paul looking down from his ivory tower at the, the rabble and telling you. He, he's saying that we all have this problem. Uh, we all have uh, a weakness of the flesh and an attraction to the world. The flesh naturally desires the things that appeal to it. The things of the earth. This is all we really know. So we have to handle that. You know, enjoy what God has given us, the nature. Enjoy the things that give us happiness. But while doing that, set our attention on what God has for us. So you can have both things. The ascetic people, asceticism, was a group that said that they could get closer to God if they suffer. Right? No, thank you. I'm not going to eat that filet mignon. I'm going to have the oatmeal with no sugar because that will get me closer to God. No, I'm not going to wear shoes. I know it's rocky out there, but if I go barefoot, I'll suffer. And God will see my suffering and like me more. You'll see people that will crawl on their knees for miles to do some kind of religious thing. They get to some religious spot thinking that this will please God. So this dual idea comes from the Gnostic idea of God is just kind of an energy blob up there, and he's really separated from us, and we got to kind of please him. So they were deluding the fact that the Holy Spirit, God himself, resides in us. And we don't have to do anything. We don't have to make him happy because he's happy with us because we're one of his kids now. And... Uh, um, my, I love my kids, whether they're good or bad. How about you? I, I expected them to be bad. 
you know, when my kids are acting really good, I'm suspecting that they're doing something behind the scenes. <laughs> you know, because that's how parents are. We, we, we learn that real quick. I see that in some of my grandchildren. And uh, I think, wow, payback is, is something, right? Uh, David has little Sammy, sweet and sour Sammy, and he's, uh, he's <laughs> something. <laughs> now Sammy's got Madeline, and he's all worried about his toys, you know. It's all about him, you know. So that's, that's the world today. We laugh at our grandkids, but we're probably not that far removed from them in our own lives, you know. And uh, so Paul wants us to focus on what's really important. Someone said this. I have no doubt that I have been saved. I'm secure in Christ, headed for heaven. But this body of flesh is not um, not redeemed. I still deal with desires and tendencies of the flesh. It, there's an acknowledgement there that our bodies are uh, subject to the whims of this world. And we have an old nature that has been uh, rendered ineffective, but if we feed it, it comes back. You know, if you... Uh, if you don't pull the roots out from the weeds, they come back every year, right? And uh, it's funny, it's not funny, but I've seen Keith fight this weed in this bush by the church every year. He, he gets it, it's all gone. And then next spring, it's smiling at you again. It's like, where did this come from? That's, that's our old nature, and we have to understand how it works so that we can render it ineffective. And that, that's why Paul deals with this section about uh, really focus on what am I really here? Why am I really here? Now, I have a men's Bible study that you should be at. If you can't come, maybe I should record it and you can watch. It's an idea. I know some of you can't drive at night, and um, that might help you. You know, uh, the book of uh, Hebrews is a really good book to learn. Anyway, uh, and I'll, I'll see how that works because I'm not necessarily the most technical guy in the one time I recorded something and all you saw was my tie. I know there's somebody up there because you can see the little white beard part, but I, I ruined one of our messages. Anyway, um, let me go on to my last point here because I'm starting this run out of time. And verse 4 it gives us an eternal um, presence. Uh, verse 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, can you say that for a fact? Just think about it for a second. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. Now, Paul's talking about various things. Now, it could happen that one of us or all of us might die before Christ comes back. So that means, if you know your eschatology, uh, you'll come with Christ when he comes to rapture the church, and you'll get your bodies uh, and then the ones that are left that are alive will come up and meet them in the air. So your your body that is buried in some box, or if you get cremated, or you know decimated by a meteorite, or something happens to you, your molecules are still there. And God will reform your body, and you'll get that glorified body like His. That's what He's talking about. Uh, when our life is, shall appear, we shall also appear with Him. So that's an interesting thing. So there's an anticipation. The Bible says in the Old Testament, and if you want to know the verse, I'll have to look it up, but I memorized just a part of it. It says, blessed are those who look forward to his coming. You know, um, we don't know when he's going to take the church, but he is going to come. So there's an anticipation there, hoping that it's coming today or tomorrow or uh, when I was in college before the finals. Lord, come quickly, we would pray at seminary, especially before the Hebrew final. Um, but our anticipation is there. When Christ shall appear, Paul doesn't speak of an event that he hoped would one day transpire. He wasn't speaking of something that he somewhat was sure of. He speaks of an eternal truth that will come to pass. And a point in time on God's calendar, our Lord will appear in the clouds of glory to rapture the church out of this world. It isn't a question of will it happen, it's it's when uh, we know the Lord is coming. It's when it's going to happen. We anticipate this. Paul spoke to those who were surrounded by difficulty and adversity. There were countless doctrines that led them down various theological paths. There was no need for confusion or doubt for the believer. Christ left this world with a promised return. His return is more certain than anything else that we know. John 14 says, Let not your heart be troubled. 
You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, and that is, third class conditional, since I'm gone, I'm gone, and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. That's Acts 1.11. Which also said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. Remember at the ascension, he went up in the clouds. That's one day he'll come back in the clouds and will be instantaneously taken up in a twinkling of an eye. One one thousandth of a second, they say. You know, that'll be it. One day it'll be over. You know, so while we're anticipating, he says, set our attention on things above. So that gives us a lot of things to think about and to apply in our lives. No more should be worried about the future, about the global, whatever, because God has it all in his hands. Um, First Corinthians says, this mortal will put on immortality. One day we'll be like him, not God, but with a sinless body, a tangible body. One day I'll teach you or talk to you about the uh, wedding feast. During the tribulation, we'll be feasting in glory. Um, I don't know if I've ever been to a feast. Anybody ever been to a feast? Closest I've ever been to a feast is at Thanksgiving, where you have uh, multiple. Now, I take it back. Once I was at this restaurant in Lancaster, and it was a all you can eat buffet, and they had everything there you know, roast beef to chicken to ham to fish, and all sorts of other things. So it was like a feast. You didn't know what to do. And uh, so we'll have seven years to eat. And you won't have to worry about diabetes or gaining weight. And it'll taste better than anything you've ever had in your life. Get, get, get that in your mind. This existence is just a shadow, just looking through a dirty window of what is in store for us in glory. That's enough for me to keep me serving him, no matter what the world says. You know, the worst thing a man can do is take your life which he really can't do. Uh, God allows that to happen, and you're ushered into his presence. It's a wonderful thought to think that God is in complete control, and we can just trust him. You ever hear this uh, song, My Hope is Built on? Nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. That's the foundation that God has given us. We're standing on a rock. Everything is prepared for us. No matter what the storm comes, he's going to provide for us. He's going to give us opportunities to be a beacon for him. Paul just says, focus your attention on these things. This is coming for us as believers. Remember I said we were a vapor and we're gone? They say that here downstairs. I don't remember. We're vapor and then we're gone. So this little opportunity we have that Christ has given us. Remember I said in Ephesians, it says that we are his workmanship. And the works he has are designed especially for us before the foundation of the world. Give me this idea that uh, this is, God is in complete control. I can trust him about anything. And I can say anything to anyone about Christ without having any fear. They could take a swing at me because I said Jesus is the only way. But I'll be right and they'll be wrong. And if I get hit, that's God's will for me. And that, that punishment is nothing compared to where I'll be with him. Paul was in prison. Paul was beaten. Paul was uh, hit with reeds. 39 minus 1. That means one less of death. He was being shipwrecked. You know, the beatings and all that stuff, you can see the enemy get them. But shipwreck, God allowed that to happen. He was bit by a serpent and lived. Was it him? Yeah, it was him. You know, and his resume looked like uh, Fox Book of Martyrs. He had the worst of the worst. And yet he was telling people, be content, trust God, look at me. You know, he's walking around in a dungeon cellar, uh, or whatever he was in, and he was happy as can be. That could be us. How would you like to have that type of uh, um, way of looking at life? Not worried about things, you know. 
Yeah, the house needs a painting. Who cares? You know, it's going to fall apart anyway. Not to say that it's not wrong to paint. Keith, Keith is licensed and things like that. Yeah, it's a good thing for him and for me. Let's pray to God. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your direction. Thank you for the simplicity of it. It's not a, a brain teaser. God is just telling us because of what has happened in Christ, you can and should and will focus on me, God himself. Focus on Christ. Focus on what he has for us. Focus on what the word tells us, that we are communicators of the truth. And uh, we can trust because we stand on a solid foundation. Help us, Father, this week to have the guts to take a stand, to say things that are true to people that have bought into the lie. Give us opportunities for that, Father. We give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's sing one more hymn together. And I believe that hymn is All That Thrills My Soul. Let's stand together and sing this great hymn.
this time. We pray you would give safety to the travelers. We give uh, opportunities for us to share Christ with others. We pray for our family, our church family that couldn't be with us today. Lord, that you would be with them. And help us, Father, to be faithful to you until the next time we come. We just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.